various tribes that are housed on a ship. Because they are in different patterns. So that's what that means. That's uh, also a uh, woodblock print. The objects are actual size embedded into the plate. It was printed in New York at a place called Atelier de la Trois, behind the star, by Maurice Sanchez. And we did it all the old way with the, with the spoons. So in that whole concept of the cult of the domestic, the people have to have their icons. So this, their gods, all made from irons also. This was called American Beauty. I also had this habit of naming everything after what it really was. So the breasts here are from an iron it's called the American Beauty Iron. So that's why it's called the American Beauty Iron. <laughs> so this is like 1989. So once I got into the New York scene and became aware of uh, some other artists in a big way, I, I thought about Cindy Sherman and Matthew Barney, who always used themselves in their work. I decided to do this piece with myself as a tribal member. So with the magic of Photoshop, I was able to tattoo my body with the scorches. So I did, uh, I did every brand, but I've only so far printed Silex and Sunbeam. So this is a Silex nail. And you can see the inspiration, I think uh, it was mentioned that I was an uh, urban anthropologist or archaeologist or something. So you can see all my tribal influences come in one by one. This is the sunbeam. <laughs> it's a little different than the, the silex. Silex I call a ritual, or this is what I call a ceremonial. I had the good pleasure of starting this year with this image on Fifth Avenue in New York in a window, 12 feet tall. So you drive down Fifth Avenue, you see me. My daughter said, I started with New Year naked in the window on Fifth Avenue. <laughs> So, so that's the history of me as uh, Willie the Scorch. <coughs> and this is where Willie the Scorch is today. This was done uh, just this year. This is 20 by, 20 by 30 image, even though I love it in this size. <laughs> and my dealer says it looks like it's a 1960s image. But I was thinking about the praise for women. Um, it's called Home and Heart. Because heart is, you know, it's hot, and home is where the love is. And these colors, all the colors represent the female uh, Orishas in the Yoruba religion. So the blue is Yemeya for the water, and these are all Oshun, which is for the <coughs> And the transformation, I'm big on transformation. As Althea says, it is, I assume you can see this a female body. This was done at uh, Experimental Print Institute at Lafayette College in Eastern Pennsylvania. Uh, as was this one. That's kind of poor resolution, I'm sorry about that. But there was a, me, a school in New Jersey. It came out of the Booker T. Washington era where they were teaching black people domestic and service skills. And my aunt went there in the 1940s. They closed the school down in the 1970s. And they have archives and photographs of women ironing. So I got Poland archive and I used that to make what I think of as kind of a Max Ernst collage and print it here. But I wish it was a clearer slide, but the symbols are all about the iron. From the periodic table, 28 protons, 30 neutrons make iron. Symbol up there is from Haiti. It's, it's called the Veve. It represents the god of iron, Odin. And the women are ironing. The women are also wearing the Dan mask, which is from the Cameroon. And the Dan mask was the link between my awareness or connection between the American steam iron and African, African imagery. Because I saw a Dan mask that had been run over. It was on the street. And I saw it as this. As a, as a, it was a, wow. I saw a steam iron on the street that had been run over by a car, and I saw it look like a damn mess. 
and that started me on this whole iron, iron journey. Uh, this is here to show you a better image of what's to follow. This is a wallpaper design that's used in this installation here. So these are, these again are women from that school ironing, and it was installed on the wallpaper. This is at the Brooks Museum as part of the Deep Impressions exhibition. I forgot it's going to go by itself there. <laughs> so you see, I'm, I'm kind of all over the place, and my whole life has been a transition now for a couple of years. So I'm not sure where I am <laughs> on the scale of my personal life. But this was my studio during big shoe days. And this time I spent most of my time going through piles and piles of shoes. When I did, I went to my local thrift store. My son had a lot of sneakers. I had a few images inside. But my son had sneakers and he knew I liked to make things out of things. He gave me like 10 pairs of sneakers. It weren't enough for me to do what I wanted to do, so I went to the Salvation Army to buy more sneakers and realized that there were more women's high heel shoes there than anything else. So I switched from sneakers to high heels like in minutes. <laughs> and I struck a deal with the store because they wanted to sell three dollars a pair. But I knew that they had a central warehouse that distributed all the Salvation Army thrift stores. So I go to the warehouse and I strike a deal for fifty cents a pound. And for about three months, I purchased every high heel they had, just me and them. Then I did the same thing, and this was like in the 90s. In the 90s, I only made like two or three uh, high heel pieces. It wasn't until 2005 that I really got into the high heels a lot. And I was at the University of Georgia, then as a fellow with Lamar Dye Chair. And uh, I went to Potter's Strip and did the same kind of deal. So I had millions and millions of shoes. So I, in the studio, it was like a uh, grocery store, a fruit stand, <laughs> where I divided each the shoes into heel size, colors, and textures. And it just made it easy for me to work with them and to see them all. So since I got that spiel on, I'm going to just skip to the next image here. <laughs> and you can see some of that work. So I had this concept also that everything is one thing, everything is the same thing. And I try to prove that to myself by making anything out of everything or everything out of anything. <laughs> so this is one of the first pieces that I really felt that I was exact with that belief system. Which I believe in general, even for life, like right now in this room, you think there's a bunch of people here, but there's, there's people, you break you, each of you down to your smallest particle and you all look exactly alike. So I said, with the shoe, I could make anything. And I just went on with it here. And a way that made it possible was to ignore scale. So I could make a, say, a Gerber Daisy, just kind of make it bigger because my particles are bigger. So I made several of these kinds of uh, things here. This is about 3,000 shoes. This is a uh, eight foot diameter. This was, I think, 2006 or seven years. And at some point, I recognized I had something similar to Ark and Boldo here. So once I had that awareness, I was able to go a little further. You know, he made the Four Seasons, which is where I'm staying. And, and he, made, he made the I would call him the court, the court, the royal court. He was the court artist for many years. What I find interesting, though, is that he was active during the slave trade. And I was wondering if he knew any black people. <laughs> you know, did he see any slaves? Or, I so I started making these things. Like, I just come from Georgia, and I experienced Georgia jugs, which are kind of like demonic faces turned into jugs. I was just thinking, you know, uh, Reverend Rudd is here tonight, Run DMC. All the black folks are there, I guess. I see, I see a few here. So, so you can see, this 